In previous sections, we've thought of the definite integral as representing area, and we've computed it as a number. In this section, we'll think of the integral itself as a function of the bounds of integration. And we'll describe the first part of the fundamental theorem relating the derivative and the integral. Suppose f of x has the graph shown here, and let g of x be the integral from 1 to x of f of t dt. I'm using t as my variable inside my integrand here, just to distinguish it from the variable x that I'm using in my bounds of integration. This expression just means the net area between 1 and some value x on the x-axis. I'll call g of x the accumulated area function because as x increases, g of x measures how much net area has accumulated. Let's calculate and plot some values of g of x. g of 1 is the integral from 1 to 1 of f of t dt. That's just 0 since the bounds of integration here are the same. g of 2 is the integral from 1 to 2 of f of t dt. That's the net area from 1 to 2, which is 2 square units. g of 3 is the integral from 1 to 3. Now we've added on an additional 2 units here and an additional 1 unit up here from this triangle for a total of 5. g of 4 is g of 3 with some additional area tacked on. The additional area measures 3 units, so g of 4 is 8. Please pause the video and fill in the next few values of g. When we go from g of 4 to g of 5, we add on an extra unit of area, so g of 5 is 9. As we go from g of 5 to g of 6, we start accumulating negative area because f is now below the x-axis. So here I've accumulated one unit of negative area, which means that g of 6 is 1 less than g of 5. In other words, g of 6 is 8. g of 7 is 5. Since we accumulate three more units of negative area. To find g of 0, the integral from 1 to 0 of f of t dt, I'm going to rewrite this integral as negative the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t dt. Since there are two units of area between 0 and 1, g of 0 is negative 2. I'll plot all these values of g on these coordinate axes and connect the dots to get an idea of what g of x looks like. Now let's think about the derivative g prime of x. We know that g prime of x is positive where g of x is increasing. But g of x is increasing wherever we're adding on positive area, that is, when f of x is positive. So we have that g prime of x is positive where f is x is positive. Also, g prime of x is negative, where g of x is decreasing. That happens when we're adding on negative area, because f of x is negative. So we can see that g prime of x is negative, where f of x is negative. Also, g prime is 0 at this local maximum, where f is 0. At that instant, we're not adding on any positive or negative area. If we look a little closer, we can see that the rate at which g of x is increasing depends on the height of f of x. When f of x is tall or high, we're adding on area very quickly, while when f of x is low or small, we're adding on area more slowly. So the rate of change of g, in other words, g prime of x, is behaving very much 
like the function f of x itself. And in fact, it turns out that g prime of x is equal to f of x. This is the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, says that if f of x is a continuous function on the closed interval from a to b, then for any x in this interval, the function g of x, the integral from a to x of f of t dt, is continuous on the interval a, b, and differentiable on the inside of this interval, and furthermore, g prime of x is equal to f of x, as we saw in the previous example. The proof of this fact relies on the limit definition of derivative and can be found in a later video. For now, let's do some examples based on this fact. First, let's find the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 5 to x of the square root of t squared plus 3 dt. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that this expression here, thought of as a function of x, is differentiable and its derivative is just the integrand function evaluated on x. This is great. We don't have to do any work here at all to evaluate the derivative. We just plug in x where we see the t here. The derivative in the second expression is also the square root of x squared plus 3. It might seem odd that these two expressions have the same derivative, but remember, in both cases, we're taking the derivative of the accumulated area function. And the rate at which area accumulates doesn't depend on the lower bound of the integral. That is, it doesn't depend on where we start counting, it just depends on the height of the function at x. For this third example, remember that the integral from x to 4 is the same thing as the negative of the integral from 4 to x. So we get the negative of the derivative from 4 to x. And applying the fundamental theorem of calculus, this gives us negative the square root of x squared plus 3. It makes sense that we should get a negative answer for this example. When we're integrating from x to 4, then as x increases, our area actually decreases. So our accumulated area function should have a negative derivative. This last example is more complicated because instead of just having x as our upper bound, we have a function of x, sine of x. We can think of sine of x as being the inside function and the accumulated area function as being an outside function and apply the chain rule. In general, the chain rule says that if we have the derivative with respect to x of a function of u of x, then that's the same thing as the derivative with respect to u of that function at u times the derivative of the inside function u of x with respect to x. Applying the chain rule to our accumulated area function, where u of x is sine x, we have that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 4 to sine x of the integral of t squared plus 3 dt can be written as the derivative with respect to u of our accumulated area function from 4 to u of the integrand times the derivative with respect to x of our u of x, which is just sine x. We can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to calculate the first derivative. By just plugging in u for t, we get u squared plus 3. And then the derivative of sine x, of course, is just cosine of x. Since we want our final answer to be entirely in terms of x, we can rewrite this as the square root of sine x squared plus 3 times cosine x or just the square root of sine squared x plus 3 times cosine of x. We could have gotten this answer more quickly by just plugging in 
this entire expression sine of x in where we saw the t here in the integrand and then multiplying the answer by the derivative of sine x due to the chain rule. This video introduced the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, that says that the derivative of the integral of a function is just the original function. In some sense, taking the derivative undoes the process of taking the integral. Derivatives and integrals are closely related and inverse operations.